Thank you everyone for joining us today. As you are logging in, we're just gonna take a couple of minutes to get everybody in the virtual room with us today. Uh, we are here joined by Lawrence Cotton for his talk on Frederick Law Olmsted Designing America, which I think you'll find is a fascinating look at all that Olmsted uh, was and is to landscape design and, and the greening of America. So I think we have lots of interesting things to talk about today. So just gonna wait a couple more minutes until two o'clock and then we'll just get started. And Lawrence, we're also hoping that with the kickoff of this Olmsted lecture and your talk that spring will officially be springing in Maine. Uh, we Absolutely. are we've been waiting for tulips to bloom and all sorts of greenery to to come out and bloom but uh we, we think that this will usher everything in I, I guarantee you within within hours <laughs> of ending this talk spring will start there in rockland great. great thank you it's a lot of pressure i understand but i think i think we can make it happen <laughs> <laughs> the transition from mud to flowers <laughs> and, gr Perfect. and green and gr eventually green grass so Perfect, perfect. Well, it's about two o'clock and I want to welcome everyone to uh, the Farnsworth Art Museum online. Today we are uh, presenting uh, our lecture on Frederick Law Olmsted from Lawrence Cotton. My name is Gwendolyn Loomis Smith. I'm the Phyllis Wyeth Director of Learning Engagement and we certainly thank you for supporting us and joining us here online today and also in the galleries whenever you can come up north uh, and have a chance to stop by the museum. The inimitable Frederick Law Olmsted is uh, always for, first in our mind when we think about landscape and green spaces. And my co-pilots for this talk on Olmsted today are Catherine Carlick and Alexis Saba, who are also my teammates at the Learning Engagement Department at the Farnsworth. Uh, after this lecture today, we will have time for some questions and answers. So if you do have any questions, be sure to put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, the Q&A box is a little easier for us to see, so please use the Q&A box and not the chat box. And we're happy to answer, uh, or Lawrence will be happy to answer whatever questions you may have. Thank you again for all your support. Um, we're certainly always enjoying to uh, be able to bring speakers to your home or wherever you are located. Um, and next time you're at the galleries, be sure to see the newly reinterpreted uh, collections at the Farnsworth as part of our Farnsworth Forward exhibition. So it, we should start today by saying that April 26 of 2022 marks the 200th anniversary of the birth of Frederick Law Olmsted, the designer of public parks and a founder of the field of landscape architecture. Historian filmmaker Lawrence Cotton, originator of and consulting producer to the PBS special, Frederick Law Olmsted Designing America, will start in just a moment for a deep dive into the remarkable life and career of this Renaissance man. He was a writer, he was a philosopher, a social reformer, an advocate for the preservation of natural scenery, and Olmsted was also the creator of some of the most beautiful public and private parks and gardens in all of North America. Lawrence Cotton has also uh, been no stranger to New England. Uh, he was raised in the eastern suburbs of Boston, and he began his career in the arenas of conflict resolution, international affairs, and international humanitarian assistance. We should mention, however, that he started uh, a very important connection when he was at uh, Hampshire College out toward the Berkshires in the middle part of the state, and he was a classmate of Ken Burns, and so soon a relationship with Ken Burns uh, in a partnership for Florentine's films actually started at that point in time. Now, as a landscape historian, Lawrence is active with the National Association for Olmsted Parks. As biographer of Frederick Law Olmsted, Lawrence now travels regularly across North America, presenting his PBS film and talk about Olmsted. Lawrence has also served on multiple nonprofit boards of directors, including as board president of Columbia Riverkeeper, and he served as trustee of the Oregon State Parks Foundation. So without further ado, we present Lawrence Cotton. Well, hello everyone. And thanks for the introduction, uh, Gwendolyn. It's truly, I gather there's quite a few signed on from across the country. Uh, not everyone is physically close to Rockland, Maine at this moment. So it's, it's, clear, uh, it, it's truly affirming to know that there are so many people with us today who are clearly interested in the name Olmsted. 
It's a pleasure to be presenting to an audience hosted by the Farnsworth Museum. Uh, though it's been a few years since I was last there, I certainly do know the beautiful museum and its superb collections. In fact, as a Bostonian, at various points of my life, I've spent a good deal of time along that very section of the Maine coast, one of my favorite places. And I'm looking forward to a return visit this summer, in fact, in August. I, I wanna thank, uh, extend my thanks to Gwendolyn for her uh, planning for this event. Also to Jude Valentine at the Farnsworth, who was my original contact there that set things in motion. And also to our able helpers today, uh, Catherine and Alexis, and uh, any other helpers that might be behind the scenes, technologically speaking. Uh, before I go any further, indeed, uh, April 26 does mark uh, this, uh, the 200th birthday of Frederick Law Olmsted. And Olmsted communities across the country, it's actually officially called Olmsted 200. You can go to olmsted200.org. Uh, and communities across the country have been planning for this for a long time. It actually commenced months ago. And it's, an, it's a year long commemoration. Yes, the birthday is just a couple of weeks, but it's a year long commemoration. And it's not just the commemoration of Olmsted seniors, uh, uh, legacy. It's a commemoration of the legacy of all the Olmsteads, generations of Olmsteads and the Olmstead Brothers firm and their imprint across all of North America. My plan today is this. I will review Olmsted's life and career. Then we will explore, in fact, the Olmsted legacy across North America, including senior, but also the works of the two sons. They will be introduced shortly. And then we will spend a little more time, finally, towards the end, focusing in on a representative sampling, a mini tour, if you will, of key Olmsted landscapes in eastern Massachusetts uh, and in the state of Maine. First, allow me to introduce the man of the hour, Frederick Law Olmsted. Here is a colorful description of the man by his friend, George Templeton Strong, a well-known public figure and diarist of the day. This is George Templeton Strong speaking. He is an extraordinary fellow. Talent and energy the most rare, absolute purity and disinterestedness, prominent defects, a monomania for system and organization. He works like a dog all day and he sits up nearly all night, doesn't go home to his family for five days together, works with steady, feverish intensity till four in the morning, sleeps on a sofa in his clothes and breakfasts on strong coffee and pickles. Well, I don't know about you folks, I have been known to breakfast on strong coffee, but the idea of breakfasting on strong pickles at six in the morning doesn't appeal. Well, here is Frederick himself reminiscing on his boyhood. I was very active, imaginative, inventive, impulsive, enterprising, trustful, heedless, a troublesome and mischievous boy. Later on, he wrote, I was nominally the pupil of a topographical engineer, but really, for the most part, given over to a decently restrained vagabond life, generally pursued under the guise of an angler, a fowler, or a dabbler on the shallowest shores of the deep sea of the natural sciences." Unquote. Well, that mischievous boy, turned vagabond, certainly eventually made something of his life. I hope you come away from today's program with a more enhanced feel for this man and what made him tick and his legacy and that of his family. Central Park, Brooklyn's Prospect Park, there's Longmeadow, Boston's Emerald Necklace, the White City of the Chicago World's Fair, the park systems of Buffalo, there's Delaware Park in Buffalo, Louisville, here's Cherokee Park in Louisville, Legacy Parks in Chicago, here's the Japanese Garden in Jackson Park in Chicago, Belle Isle in Detroit, you'll note that I often like to use vintage art cards for some of my uh, slides here. Here is the Olmsted Lydia Park in the Druid Hills section of Atlanta. The Biltmore Estate, famously in Asheville, North Carolina. In Washington, D.C., the, the nation's capital, the U.S. Capitol Grounds. The green suburb of Riverside, Illinois. Mount Royal Park in what the French would call Montréal. And the Niagara Falls State Reservation on the New York side of the waterfall complex. Those are just a handful of the more celebrated, masterful landscapes designed by Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. But if you add in the park designs and landscapes carried out by the two sons and the Olmsted brothers firm, the imprint across the geography of North America is simply astounding. 700 public parks, and by the way, about 6,000 commissions in the life of the Olmsted brothers firm. Now, some of those commissions remained ideas only on paper. Most of them were completed at the ground level in some fashion. I want to share a few ideas from media coverage in the past few years. 
Perhaps some in our audience read this a few years ago in the New York Review of Books, an article titled America's Green Giant by scholar Martin Filler. He included discussions of new volumes by and about Olmsted, including this one featured here, which I recommend to you, by the way. Filler, after initially calling attention to the acclaim that has been received by the High Line Linear Park, which many of you will know, along Manhattan's west side, a critic Filler writes this, quote, yet however much the High Line has enriched the penny, the post-millennial megalopolis. Its social effects pale in comparison to the revolutionary vision of the public park as promulgated by its greatest American exponent, the 19th century polymath, Frederick Law Olmsted, unquote. Well, I expect some of you read this uh, column during, a year ago in the, during the COVID winter of 2021 in the pages of the New York Times. A moving, I have to give you a picture of Central Park in winter to start with. A moving essay by Machiko Kakutani, who is an avid bird watcher. The heading of her column was Finding Refuge and a Snowy Owl in Central Park. This is but an extract of that. Quote, Central Park has long provided a refuge from the anxieties and stresses of daily life, perhaps never more so than during the coronavirus. New Yorkers who visited the park every day, as well as those who had long taken it for granted, felt a renewed love for this amazing rectangle of green in the heart of the big city. It's startlingly lush woodlands and rolling lawns. It's meandering trails and wide open meadows. And of course, it's astonishing wildlife, including owls. Here's the very snowy owl, hawks, herons, and a dizzying array of other birds who for generations have used Central Park as a vital rest stop in their migratory travels, knowing what many humans only came to fully appreciate during the uncertainties of the pandemic, that the park is a beautiful and essential sanctuary." Unquote. Thank you, Machiko. Beautiful, lovely piece. Just to give you a sense of the path that brought me to this film project, when I was young, I would visit the house of my maternal grandparents, very near Boston's Franklin Park, which is at the terminus of the Emerald Necklace. As an adult, I would regularly walk along Olmsted's Back Bay Fens and the Fenway uh, to visit the famous art museums of the area, the MFA, the Museum of Fine Arts, and the Isabella Stewart Gardening Museum. I would jog around uh, further down the riverway, as it's called now. I would jog around Jamaica, beautiful Jamaica Pond. A little further down, I would botanize my early botanical adventures and also just exercise and stroll and in the winter cross-country ski at the Olmsted-designed Harvard Arnold Arboretum. All of those parks are integrated into Boston's famed Emerald Necklace, a crescent of Olmsted designed parks and parkways that wind around a major portion of the city of Boston. Of course, a little bit later, uh, and still in my uh, college years, I would visit Central Park and eventually come across Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And the first time I entered through this very arch, Endell Arch, and looked down the expanse of the long meadow in Prospect Park, tears welled up in my eyes as I was simply overwhelmed by its sheer beauty and utter perfection. And this is pre-restoration Endell Arch. It's been restored recently. Uh, perhaps some, yeah, and this was, by the way, decades before the notion of making this film was even a glimmer in my eye, I have to tell you. Perhaps some in our virtual audience today saw our original PBS film, Frederick Law Olmsted Designing America. Perhaps you caught the original broadcast. Perhaps you managed to locate it online or watched it on one of the streaming platforms. But I learned, I learned very shortly after moving to Portland, Oregon, some 27 years ago that the entire park system where I'm speaking to you today from was master planned by another Olmsted, the stepson, John Charles Olmsted. Uh, after uh, completing a prior film and thinking about what would be next, I began to dive deep into the at then existing Olmsted biographies, more have been released since, doing a little research. Before long, I approached an old friend back in Massachusetts, Lawrence Hott, a noted uh, and accomplished filmmaker and an associate of Ken Burns, and I proposed a collaboration. Well, it did take seven years, by the way, folks, as these things often do, but our 2014, our film did premiere before live audiences in, in key uh, cities across the nation. And of course, eventually it did premiere on nationwide on most PBS stations. Now, uh, and you could say that's what brings me here today. I've not only continued to screen the film, but since that time, I've dived ever deeper into this Olmsted story. It's become kind of a lifelong discovery process, for lack of a better way to put it. Visiting yet more parks, sometimes private estates, which are not normally open to the public, uh, uh, di diving, diving deeper into the scholarly literature, into the archives, uh, interviewing scholars, meeting with contemporary landscape 
design professionals. Uh, and uh, it's, it's been a learning experience, needless to say. But allow me now to uh, uh, share, to summarize, if you will, some of the salient content of the film, which would be helpful, especially for those who haven't seen it, but also to expand upon that content and to share some of my gleanings with you. Rather than reviewing Olmsted's entire career in this program, what I want to simply do at the outset is to launch him on his career trajectory and hint at some of the stops along the curvilinear path, if you will, that caused him to become America's great park maker. His early years in brief, his life began, whoops, sorry, wrong direction, folks. I apologize. Here we are. His life began uh, in 1822 as the first son of the successful merchant John Olmsted of Hartford, Connecticut. As a youth, Olmsted roamed his native Connecticut countryside, initially on his father's saddle on horseback in silent contemplative trips through the New England countryside. Young Frederick attended several boarding schools in Connecticut, but he had to abandon plans for college due to weak eyesight. He briefly worked for a New York City dry goods importing firm, but the young man was captured by the romance of life at sea. And in 1843, he set out for China as an apprentice seaman. Thus, young Fred Olmsted had his year before the mast, if you will, as a seaman sailing to China and back. In fact, it was a rather harrowing experience. Olmsted did attend lectures at Yale, including one on the subject of scientific agriculture, another one on chemistry, uh, though his younger brother, John Hull Olmsted, did manage to matriculate at Yale, not Fred. However, he did spend a great deal of time in the company of his brother and other Yaleys. And here they are. Let's see if my, you can follow my cursor. Here's uh, John Hull Olmsted, the younger brother on the top, with his uh, right arm list, uh, resting on the shoulder of a compadre. Right below him here is Frederick Law with his right arm around the shoulder of his good friend, Charles Loring Brace. Now, Charles Loring Brace would go on to become one of the leading social reformers of the late 19th century, a founder of the Children's Aid Society in New York City, and he remained a lifelong friend and influence to Frederick Law. Now, uh, in 1846, Olmsted began to explore a career, in fact, as a scientific farmer, a field that was on the rise at this time. First, he apprenticed at a model farm near Syracuse, New York. Then with his father's financial assistance, which was crucial early on, I have to tell you, he farms first on the Connecticut shore at a property that didn't work out real well. But subsequently, he buys a larger property on Staten Island, Tussamuck Farm. Here it is. This is Olmsted's own sketch of the property below. This is uh, uh, an early 20th century black and white photograph up above. It still exists, by the way. I'll show you a picture in just a sec. But there at Tussamuck Farm, Olmsted does make some considerable improvements to the property. He's experimenting in scientific agriculture, and he's experimenting with uh, drainage techniques, by the way, which will come in very handy in the early phase of the construction of Central Park. Let's see if I have a new image of it. This is what it looks like. If you wanted to... Uh, uh, you could go there today, and this is what you would find. This is approximately what it looks like. It was recently placed on the National Historic Register, and it is being restored. A nonprofit is raising funds to restore the landscape and the structure to as close to its original condition as possible. It will be open in the future for historic home tours, but it's not in that state yet. Now, in 1850, Frederick travels to Europe and the British Isles in the company of both his brother, John Hall Olmsted, and his good friend, Charles Loring Brace. Also in 1850, Olmsted is hired by the New York Times to tour the South and file reports from the field. In 1855, Olmsted becomes partner in the firm that publishes the popular Putnam's Monthly Magazine. Here it is from 1855. That business, however, fails in 1857, but that same year, Olmsted's first book about the South coming out of his reporting for the Times, uh, a title of which is A Journey in the Sleeve Seaboard Slave States, is published. 1857 is a momentous year in Olmsted's life. He's appointed first superintendent of Central Park. And it is after that that he and English-born architect Calbert Vox collaborate on this, the famous winning design for the park called Greensward. And with that success, Olmsted is appointed architect-in-chief for Central Park. And this is the image we always see of him during this time with his characteristic cape and hat. And in 1859, Frederick marries Mary Cleveland Perkins Olmsted, his brother's widow. His dear young brother, John Hall Olmsted, died young in Europe from tuberculosis, and he left a moving letter uh, suggesting that his brother consider marrying his, his uh, Mary, uh, who 
and to, and to take care of her children. And Olmsted does this. He marries Mary, and he formally adopts her children, raising them as his own. In 1861, Olmsted is appointed General Secretary of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, a Civil War era national medical relief effort securing aid and supplies for wounded soldiers. More about that in a few minutes. In fact, more on all of these topics in a few minutes. After resigning his appointment with the Sanitary Commission, Olmsted is appointed commissioner of the Yosemite and Mariposa Mining Estates. He moves his entire family to the Sierra Nevada. Here they are picnicking in the Mariposa Grove on horseback. Here is Frederick and Mary uh, on the bo uh, bottom left front row. Here they are in the Mariposa Grove picnicking in 1864. And there, Olmsted manages a gold mine in a roughneck mining town. Here it is, Mariposa, California in 1860. And while there, he's appointed to a California State Commission. He plays a leadership role in writing the first report proposing the permanent protection of Yosemite Valley to the state of California. More about that report in a bit, by the way. In 1865, Olmsted is reappointed landscape architect for Central Park. And with Calvert Fox in Brooklyn, whoops, here's another image of Yosemite Valley for you. And uh, we'll return to that. And with Calvert Vox and returning from California, Calvert Vox brings him back to join him on the design for Prospect Park. And over here on the right is that famous design for Prospect Park. This is Calvert Vox on the left. And subsequently, there on Broadway in Manhattan, Olmsted and Vox opened the first office of landscape architecture practice in the US, thus launching a unique career. Now, over the course of his life, Olmsted experienced considerable family tragedy, early deaths of mother, brother, and children, his own near death in a terrible carriage accident in Central Park that left him maimed for the rest of his life, and was plagued by a nearly lifelong struggle with dark depression. And then, with a host of other physical ailments towards the end of his life, yet even then fighting infirmities and utter exhaustion, he was still designing the landscape for the 1893 World Columbian Exposition in Chicago and the grounds of the Biltmore Estate and supervising the creation of these, his final masterpieces. Then, after a few years of waning physical and mental health, tragically, Olmsted lost his mind. He, was, he faced pretty severe senility. Olmsted passed away in 1903 at the McLean Asylum on the outskirts of Boston, an institution the very grounds of which he had designed. What a story. What a life. Now, let's review certain aspects of that career. Or perhaps, shall we say careers, his many full roles of scientific farmer, social reformer, capable administrator, writer, editor, and literary publisher, landscape designer, and master park builder. Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. was first and foremost a social reformer, and his career was central to the social reform movement of the U.S. during the second half of the 19th century. He was a philosopher of democracy. He read widely and deeply and wrote thoughtfully about the subject and manifested it in his philosophy of park design and in his actual park creations. This is what Olmsted, this is one of one of many extracts of what Olmsted had to say about Central Park, and we'll enjoy a nice picture of the sheep meadow reopening in spring 2021 after a long COVID closure. This is Olmsted. In Central Park, you will find all classes largely represented with a common purpose, each individual adding by his mere presence to the pleasure of all others, all helping to the greater happiness of each. You often see vast numbers of persons brought close to, closely together, poor and rich, young and old. As one of our commentators, historian Keith Morgan said, Olmsted intensely believed in democracy and the park is a site for the enactment of democracy. In fact, one could argue, and this has been even highlighted more so by very recent scholarship, one could argue that Central Park was Olmsted's response to what he witnessed in the South and the Civil War. That this great park would provide a counterpoint as a welcoming democratic space where anyone could gather regardless of origin or background. The same thing could be said about Olmsted's involvement with the early idea for our national park system, by the way. Though he strayed away from describing himself as such, he was indeed an artist. As is stated by historian Sarah Cedar Miller, Central Park is arguably the most important piece of American art in the 19th century. Clearly, it was indeed the most monumental in scale. Author and Olmsted expert Elizabeth Barlow Rogers, the founder of the Central Park Conservancy, she had this to say about Central Park in our film, and uh, it's, it's a nugget. Quote, it is a triumph of 19th century engineering, a symphonic sequence 
of beautiful spaces. And there is indeed a musical element and a theatrical element to these masterwork landscape designs. This is how I like to capture it, by the way. Now, you heard that I uh, attended college in the Connecticut River Valley. That's right, I did. And I lived there for a few years. I know it intimately. This is a very famous canvas course. Uh, one of the founders of the Hudson River School, Thomas Cole. Typically, I think it's referred to as the Oxbow, but unless I'm mistaken, the actual title of this canvas is After a Thunderstorm. By the way, there is a little, uh, there's an artist here in this landscape, which is pretty cool. A lot of people don't realize that. So this is an Oxbow on the uh, Connecticut River, just a few miles from where I attended college. And I know this very site. I've been here. This is, uh, this is Mount Holyoke. So while you're just appreciating this landscape, and I realize, of course, there are canvases of the Hudson River School on display at the Farnsworth Museum. Uh, in um, this period of uh, landscape design in America, it's formative period, uh, influenced by the uh, romantic literary movement in England and also English landscape design. Uh, and of course, the Hudson River School itself captured this. You hear about references to the sublime and to the pastoral and the picturesque. Now, in an urban setting, it's hard to recreate the sublime. After all, what's the sublime? The sublime is the Alps. The sublime is Niagara Falls. The sublime is Yosemite Valley. It's kind of hard to create the sublime in an urban park setting, but you can certainly create the pastoral and the picturesque. Rather than uh, detailing it to you in words, I'm just going to show it to you. Here's the pastoral picture of the difference between, oop, I'm sorry. I jumped ahead of myself, folks. Let's talk first about the English landscape designers that did uh, influence uh, uh, Olmsted. Here is Capability Brown uh, in England. I'm going to lead up to that, what I was just saying a minute ago. Here's Humphrey Repton. These were two key English landscape designers that uh, influenced Olmsted in uh, the UK. And we also have to uh, keep in mind uh, that uh, you have Andrew Jackson Downing here in the US. Andrew Jackson Downing here in the US, uh, who was so instrumental and so influential uh, upon Olmsted. Now, uh, what I was saying, uh, and let's go back one more time to the Hudson River School, and I'm gonna, I apologize. So this is what I wanna say here regarding the Hudson River School. What Olmsted, what the Hudson River School painters were doing in two dimensions, in pigment and brush, on canvas, Olmsted and Vox, Olmsted and Vox together initially with their masterworks, Central Park, Prospect Park. They were drawing, painting, and sculpting the landscapes of our great cities, not in two dimensions, not in three dimensions, but in four dimensions. What is the fourth dimension? I think everyone will get it, time. In Olmsted's own words, I have in all my life been considering distant effects and always sacrificing immediate success and applause to that of the future. And laying out Central Park, we determined to think of no results to be realized in less than 40 years years. Now, you don't have to read too much of Olmsted or to see his parks to realize, and he didn't just think 40 years ahead, he, he thought hundreds of years ahead. He had that kind of vision and foresight for his projects. Now, let's, I apologize, I got ahead of myself. Now, I also do want to mention this. Remember, I was talking about uh, the pastoral and the picturesque. Here is, once again, is another image of Sheep Meadow in Central Park. An easy, easy walk from Sheep Meadow takes you to the Ramble. Here is the pastoral, and here is the picturesque. From the pastoral to the picturesque. There it is, the Ramble. Uh, and that's, that's the best visual representation that I can show you. And the same thing applies in the masterworks and the elements. You can be seen in the Long Meadow and the wooded ravines and other uh, uh, picturesque uh, portions of uh, Prospect Park and all the other great Olmsted masterwork parks across America. And the same thing applies to his sons, by the way, the, pic the pastoral and the picturesque. Now, as builder of Central Park, as builder of Central Park, Olmsted successfully managed thousands of men in one of the largest construction projects to that time in America. During the Civil War, by the way, as director of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, the forerunner to the Red Cross, Olmsted uh, perfected his own management skills while heading up a huge supply medical relief and field hospital outfit, including managing a, I call it, an armada of hospital ships. And here is the interior of a uh, Sanitary Commission hospital ship on the Mississippi. And during this time, Olmsted reorganized the Army Medical Corps. He coordinated contributions and volunteers from local aid societies. In fact, by the way, the Sanitary Commission was the largest 
national public health initiative up to that time in American history, I have to tell you. And at that time, sanitary fairs were held in the major cities of the North. Some of the women's leaders of the, of the day in that era in the North were involved with these sanitary fairs, raising funds to support them. This is one such fair in Philadelphia. And by the way, that's Catherine Prescott Warmly. Not only was she involved with these fairs, she was an, an active nurse in the field with Olmsted. And there's wonderful um, descriptive um, a, 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 a writing of Catherine Pors Prescott Warmly describing Olmsted at work. They had a close working relationship. In fact, by the way, speaking of the Civil War, Olmsted was right there in the aftermath of two of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War, Antietam and at Gettysburg. And here is a sanitary uh, commission field hospital in Gettysburg in 1863. What about his writings? Let's talk about his writings for a little bit. Olmsted early on published a travelogue and a reflective series of essays in the volume Walks and Talks of an American Farmer in England. The original volume is on the left. You too can buy this edition on the right. And it was at that point, particularly while exploring the English countryside, that Olmsted was working out what overarching landscape design concepts he thought best to apply to American soil. And by doing so to enhance the public park experience for everyone, not just the wealthy elite, as it was up until that point in time. In fact, Olmsted was particularly inspired in England by England's very first public park, Birkenhead Park, just across the water from Liverpool. Here is another image, Birkenhead Park in England, designed by Joseph Paxton. In fact, Olmsted admitted that he was so inspired by this park that he actually borrowed some of its, his favorite design elements and placed them right into his greensward plan that he, he co-created with uh, Calvert Fox for Central Park. On another front, the Literary Republic. Olmsted's three volumes, he was a, he was a writer, editor, and publisher for a period of time here. And he wrote three volumes initially about his journeys to the South uh, and uh, Frontier, Texas and Kansas. Uh, and it was later uh, reissued in a single volume titled The Cotton Kingdom. You can do, you too can buy a version of this today. Uh, there are uh, versions out there with introductions by Arthur Schlesinger Jr. still. He also produced a, pap a map to go along with this of the Cotton Kingdom. Now, his journalistic career actually started when he was hired by the early iteration of the New York Daily Times, as it was first called, as a Roman correspondent in what seemed to be a foreign land, the antebellum South, at least foreign to Northerners, certainly at this time. And uh, when this was published in England, where his writings about his graphic descriptions of, of the institution of slavery and his analysis of the economics of slavery, it was published in England it actually, it actually had a huge influence. Uh, in the buildup to the Civil War, British public opinion was leaning towards supporting the Confederacy. Olmsted's writings were published there. They swayed the intelligentsia and British public opinion away from the Confederacy toward a more neutral stance at the outset of the Civil War. And these writings are pub were cited by none other than Charles Darwin as influential in his struggling with the concept of race as he was preparing the origin of species for publication. It actually had that kind of impact. Now, I, I wish I could go on on this. This is deserving of another whole topic, but it even had a profound influence on the young Malcolm X subsequently in the early 20th century, I'll have you know. Now, in addition to his stint as publisher and co-editor for Putnam's Monthly, Olmsted co-founded The Nation magazine. And he played a key role as editor and public editor of that publication in its very early years. During his relatively brief period in this career, as he was a, became a literary publisher, he befriended and published some of the more prominent writers and intellects of the day, to name but a few. We're going to start on the left. I hope you all recognize these. Here's Ralph Waldo Emerson. He was, by the way, quite influenced by Olmsted's famous volume on nature. Here's Henry David Thoreau, Herman Melville, and Harriet Beecher Stowe. Can that is to be list can be added quite a few others, including uh, uh, Washington Irving, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and others. Uh, they were uh, part of Olmsted's circle in one way or another. Uh, at least he knew them from the literary perspective as a as a publisher. Now, in addition to the uh, this, he had several contact with several key member painters of the Hudson River School, and particularly the next generation of the Hudson River School painters, Frederick Edwin Church. They had a social friendship, if you will. This is obviously not Church himself. This is a famous canvas of Niagara Falls by Church. But you get the point between Putnam's Monthly and the nation through his social circle and his ties to the cultural leadership, his contacts, you could say that they were a veritable who's who of the arts and letters of America during this era. And to that list, by the way, can be added many of the leading social reformers of the day. 
one note in our in our film, we did try to give some due credit to Calvert Fox, uh, Olmsted's partner, the man who brought Olmsted into the actual design of Central Park, who subsequently convinced Olmsted to return to the business of park building when Prospect Park became possible. And poor Vox, the sometimes neglected, lesser known partner, at least to the general public at this point in time, a great architect in his own right, yet a man that time seems to have passed over. We wanted to give him some due credit in our film. Now, it's important to understand the origins of the public park movement at this time in North America. In the highly polluted cities of the 19th century, trees, shrubs, and lawns, parks served as the lungs of the city, famously, creating refuges of fresh air. Park advocates argued that parks provided refined imitations of nature and that exposure to them would improve people's character. There was a moral imperative, if you will, at this time, maybe somewhat paternalistically so, but uh, the, the notion that parks, exposure with parks uh, would improve people's moral character, if you will, regardless of their socioeconomic status. An architect and landscape designer, Andrew Jackson Downing, wrote this uh, very presciently so, I think in 1848. This is what he wrote. I love this. Let's give him another picture. Here's Andrew Jackson Downing. Quote, Parks would be better preachers of temperance than temperance societies, better refiners of national manners than dancing schools, and better promoters of general good feeling than any lectures on the philosophy of happiness, unquote. Quite fascinating that he wrote that in the 19th century. And sentiments like that reflected the influence of the romantics on the new world's attitudes towards nature. What had once been seen as something separate from humans to be conquered and feared became something humans were a part of that they could turn to for restoration. Olmsted and Downing also brought their experiences of touring European and British gardens to the U.S., further emphasizing the beneficial relationship between humans and nature and democratizing the public park experience. Before Central Park, I have to tell you, the principal place for urban New Yorkers, and I also have to tell you, largely upper middle class New Yorkers, to walk in nature were the paths of the Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, still there today, beautiful bucolic place that you can still tour today, not far from Prospect Park, by the way. And by the way, the same thing applied to Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, much the same. I should emphasize that parks were absolutely seen as instruments for public health. In the mid-19th century, New York and all cities were still dealing with terrible outbreaks of cholera and other diseases. In fact, Frederick Law and Mary Olmsted lost their first child due to a cholera outbreak in New York City. You can be sure it had an impact. And by the way, uh, uh, of course, indeed, Central Park did indeed serve as the lungs of the city, and even more so on at least one occasion. Olmsted actually referred to Central Park as a public health institution. Isn't that interesting? In their argument supporting the design for Central Park, Olmsted and his collaborator Vox wrote this in 1868, quote, there is no doubt that the more intense intellectual activity which prevails equally in the library, the workshop, and the counting room makes tranquilizing recreation more essential to continued health and strength. Civilized men are growing more and more subject to the insidious enemies to their health and happiness. And against these, the remedy cannot be found in medicine or in athletic recreations, but only in sunlight and in such forms of gentle exercise as are calculated to equalize the circulation and relieve the brain, unquote. Now, that's somewhat archaic language from the 19th century, and you may not entirely agree with their case for passive versus active recreation. After all, times have changed considerably in that respect. But I want to actually clarify one thing. Olmsted actually used a phrase. He said you could go to the park to recreate yourself. Two words, hyphenated. You would recreate yourself in a public park experience. He actually wanted everyone to have an opportunity to have a mini Walden Pond experience, if you will, but even together communally and a, especially in his larger public parks. By the way, I would describe Olmsted, uh, along with Henry David Thoreau for that matter, as an early proponent of what you could call forest bathing, a concept, the modern version of which had originated in Japan much in vogue at this time. I have to wonder folks, what Olmsted would think if he were with us at this moment, however, when he would see so many people wandering around the outdoors with a soundtrack continuously beaming into their ears or worse. Or worse, uh, not observing the natural world, but rather looking down with their eyes entranced by their shimmering screens. Now, I am as guilty of this as are any of you. And this is nothing against this trio planted on their park bench, and they may be solving the problems of the world for all I know, but you know what they're doing. They're paying attention to their social media feeds. 
What kind of a park experience is that, Olmsted would ask. Okay, now our film zooms in on the stories of Central Park, Prospect Park, Buffalo, and Boston's Emerald Necklace. A few comments about those projects before I move on. Obstead and Vox, by the way, considered Prospect Park their masterpiece, as, by the way, do many scholars today. Uh, for one, uh, they, weren't as hem they weren't hemmed in by a rectangular area as they were at Central Park. They didn't encounter nearly the same level of fiscal or uh, political interference. They didn't need to make as many compromises with their original design. Now, I don't think I have it, but just uh, back to Central Park for a sec, uh, sorry, Prospect Park for a sec. I don't have an image with you for you at this moment. Keep in mind, if you go there today, you'll see Endale Arch in its newly restored condition. It's quite extraordinary. It's worth going there. Just walk through the restored Endale Arch and into the expanse of the Long Meadow. Now, about Boston, uh, uh, the Back Bay Fens project. Now, uh, that Olmsted first tackled his first project in Boston, by the way. Here is the original Olmsted design uh, for the uh, Back Bay Fens on the left. Here is a portion of a modern uh, day uh, emerald necklace map on the right. Here is how the Back Bay Fens fits into the larger city of Boston in this area. But what is cool about this, this was the transformation of a tidal basin that was in essence part of the public sewers for the city of Boston. And this is what it looks like now. This can be pointed to as the first true wetland restoration project in the history of the United States, by the way. I could talk about many of the delightful discoveries in the making of this film. One, in fact, was Buffalo. Before beginning research on the film, I hadn't been to Buffalo since I was six years old. I did have a, uh, I did have a memory of Niagara Falls, and that was about it. But you could say there in Buffalo, the Olmsted Park system in Buffalo is one of the best preserved and maintained uh, in all of America. Here is a glimpse of, of, of two of those Olmsted parks in Buffalo. That's Delaware Park on the right, two of the many parks designed by Senior and Calvert Vox in Buffalo. Uh, there is uh, Delaware Park on the left, Front Park on the right. And it's worth noting that these parks were indeed designed as the first integrated, another map, first integrated uh, park system in America the first truly integrated park system in America, all connected by parkways, which were invented by Olmsted and Vox on this occasion. The whole idea behind, the brilliant idea behind this folks was to think of the city as being contained within one giant park or a system of parks with parkways and landscaped traffic circles connecting all of these elements so that anyone in any part of Buffalo could be within an easy walk of a park-like environment. Maybe not a major park, but a park-like environment. And this was invented all and put into place. It's still there today in Buffalo. It's quite extraordinary. Here are a couple of those parkways, by the way. It's, uh, and it might, you know, the captions, I don't know what it is. The pictures often reverse themselves. It's actually Lincoln Parkway on the right with equestrian traffic in the middle in the 19th century. And it's modern day Bidwell Parkway on the left. Now, by the way, not far from, I'm going to be talking about uh, H. H. Uh, collaborations between H.H. H. Richardson and Olmsted a little later, so I'll show you one in Buffalo. Not far from downtown Buffalo is this, the Richardson Olmsted complex. It's quite extraordinary. It's been fully restored, recently reopened post-COVID. The Hotel Henry is there. It started out, by the, by the way, the building, of course, is Henry Hobson Richardson, the landscape by Frederick Law Olmsted. It started out life as the Buffalo Insane Asylum. And it's one of many such collaborations between these two individuals in New York State and Massachusetts. It's quite an amazing collaboration, not unlike Olmsted's earlier collaborations with Calvert Vox, I have to tell you. Now, what, not far from Buffalo, what else is there in that area? There's the Niagara Falls State Reservation designed by Olmsted and Vox. A little background is in order here, by the way. In the 1860s at Yosemite, Olmsted had advanced the theory that a republic had the responsibility to protect scenic beauty. In, eight, in the 1870s, he put theory into practice at the highly degraded industrial site of Niagara Falls. This is what it looked like, everyone. And the national campaign to preserve the waterfall complex was called the Free Niagara Movement, led by Olmsted. It amounted to the first big national campaign for scenic preservation, and it resulted in unprecedented legislation by the city of the state of New York to create a brand new state park, the first state park in the nation, unless I'm mistaken, to protect Niagara Falls and to return it to some semblance of its natural state. They brought, Olmsted, of course, Olmsted and Vox were hired to uh, design the park. And uh, here is their plan for the park uh, on the, it's the New York State Reservation on the American side, of course. Here is the part that you might visit as a public 
when you first arrive, but I want to focus on this Goat Island, which we, uh, uh, we, we talk about in our film. Francis Kowski, a local scholar, talks about Goat Island in our film. Go out to Goat Island. You have to revisit Niagara Falls, folks, if you haven't been in years. Go out to Goat Island. Here's the first bridge that crosses the first set of rapids. Here is the second bridge to the three sisters at Goat Island. Go to Goat Island and you will have a transformative experience on the over the rapids above the waterfall, a completely different experience. Now, let's briefly talk about John Charles Olmsted, the older brother, sequentially nephew, stepson, business partner of Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. The young man learned his father's acute skills of reading the land, understanding soils and vegetation types. He acquired his father's artistic skills as draftsman, as landscape designer. He joined the stepfather's firm in 1875 after graduating from Yale. He worked with his father on many projects, by the way, before he retired, including, uh, here he is at uh, Fairstead, the family home and family uh, business site. But he worked on quite a few projects early on, including famously, uh, I believe this is the first countywide park system in America, Essex County, New Jersey, an extraordinary park, collection of parks. This is Branch Brook Park, very near downtown Newark right now, what it would look like with the cherry blossoms in full bloom. And it's a, it's a gorgeous park. Uh, he took over his father's initial work on this. Now, in addition to the Essex County system, he also worked in Atlanta, Louisville, and Chicago. This is John Charles. He also left a huge mark in the Pacific Northwest across urban and rural landscapes, the entire region. He was invited out here where I am now by the cities of Portland, Spokane, and Seattle. And upon his first visits to the area, this is a, a steep hillside with Douglas fir looking uh, west over Puget Sound with islands in the middle ground and, and mountains in the distance. He was struck by this kind of terrain and these kinds of vistas. Vistas like this as well. There is Mount Rainier hovering in the distance behind a 1920s uh, uh, downtown Seattle. He was struck by these kinds of vistas that he wanted to capitalize on. Now, he also changed his appearance. He spent more and more time traveling back and forth from Boston to Portland. And during this time, he, he left Boston looking like a proper Bostonian. And he ended up with, a, I, I can only call it a, a Sherlock Holmes look in the Pacific Northwest. It's the only thing that's missing is the pipe. But uh, he spent more and more time out here, folks. And in my hometown in these past 27 years, he started with this project, the 1905 Lewis and Clark Centennial Exposition that literally put Portland on the national map. A few years later, he did the same thing in Seattle with what the locals there call it the AYP Exposition of 1909. Now, I want you to look at the sight lines here. This is an exaggerated perspective, but here is this is the AYP Exposition. This is the Court of Honor. Look what's in the distance looming in an exaggerated fashion. It's not accurate, but there's Mount Rainier to the southeast. Look at this next picture, because this very place becomes the modern day campus, the centerpiece of the modern day campus of the University of Washington, what locals call UW. Here it is, University of Washington. There's the Drumheller Fountain, as it's called now, the Court of Honor. This is all the campus. There in the distance, much more accurately, is Mount Rainier. Now, uh, here uh, in Seattle, uh, Olmst, John C. Olmsted did a tremendous amount of work, more than any other city of the Pacific Northwest. In fact, this map of Seattle with its parks and parkways reminds me so much of his father's plan for uh, Buffalo. And in fact, it was modeled after that. There's no question about it. He worked on, John C. Olmsted worked on 35 different projects for the Seattle Park System. I'm only going to show you a few because we're going to want to move to other parts of the country. But here is Volunteer Park. Here is Green Lake Park, one of my favorites, right in the heart of the city, practically. Here is the Washington Park Arboretum. Arguably, Vol Volunteer Park, by the way, you could say remains the crown jewel of Olmsted Park designs in Seattle. But here is the crown jewel of Olmsted Park designs in Portland. It's my neighborhood park. I'm speaking to you from it today, at least virtually speaking. Uh, now, it wasn't actually, Olmsted master planned the parks here. He actually had an anointed first park superintendent trained by the Olmsted brothers who actually designed the parks in the Olmsted manner. Laurelhurst is often pointed to as the most perfect representative of those. Now, in addition to all the many parks that uh, came out of the master plan in the city of Portland, also uh, Olmsted, John C. Olmsted wrote a report proposing that the city protect this vast forested landscape in the hills that overlook downtown Portland. That's Forest Park. This is how it fits in with the city of Portland. Uh, this is the Willamette River. This is an industrial area. Here's the St. John Suspension Bridge. Here's downtown. This large park, Forest Park, still here today, 
now at 5,100 acres and counting, is the second largest urban forest reserve in the United States. It all came out of John C. Olmsted's master plan recommendations for the city of Portland in 1908. Uh, this is, uh, it's riddled with uh, 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 beautiful trails. This is one of the modern day bridges on one of those trails in Forest Park. By the way, it has, uh, it has old growth forest preserves within it, old growth trees, and it's a wildlife corridor for elk. And there are even occasional sightings of black bear and cougar within maybe 10 miles of downtown Portland. And I can tell you, I've seen, I've experienced them. There are herds of elk occasionally in the northern edge of this park. It's pretty cool. Now, uh, before I turn to the younger son, uh, Frederick Olmsted Jr., I do want to introduce the, uh, the, the uh, world, uh, the uh, beautiful movement, the city beautiful movement, I beg your pardon. The City Beautiful Movement. And, and, and on his work on the World Columbian Exposition, the elder Olmsted had further developed his ideas for planning a comprehensive system of parks, shaping the land to create spaces that seemed natural, but in fact had been highly designed to achieve a particular effect. He believed cities could be improved through the application of the principles of landscape architecture. In a democracy, he argued, and others, the health of the Republic relied on the civic health of the voting population. That public parks could, in and of themselves, enhance the civic strength of a community. By the way, Lake Park in Milwaukee, which is an extraordinary jewel up there, is pointed to as a city beautiful park during this time. Planning with a comprehensive view was a new idea in North American cities. Up until then, cities often grew in a haphazard fashion. This was the very beginning of urban planning, by the way. So as the 19th century progressed, the idea of guiding city development to improve living conditions and promote economic development gained currency. And what would become known as the city beautiful movement had its roots, in fact, in the World Columbian Exposition of 1893 here in the US. Now, uh, the director of that World's Fair, famous big ego architect, Daniel Burnham, used the exposition to showcase how architecture Landscape design and plan development could create the White City, a beautiful, orderly, functional space that contrasted sharply with the many chaotic and disorderly urban areas at the time. I fully re realized, by the way, that the White City was a temporary stage set, a folly and a utopian fantasy. But it did set something in motion, something significant, including what would eventually become the Macmillan Plan for Washington, D.C., now, speaking of the Macmillan plan, let's turn to Senior's namesake, his own son, Frederick Olmsted Jr., who was a little more influential in Maine, by the way, often referred to as Rick, the younger brother, who also was brought into the family practice. He left a considerable mark across America from Southern California to Florida and to the nation's capital. He was born on Staten Island, the son of Frederick Olmsted and Mary Perkins Olmsted. From his earliest years, here is young Rick Olmsted. He was aware of his father's fervent desire to have him carry on both the family name and profession. And from early on, the father insisted that the son become far better educated in botany and horticulture than, than the father was. In the waning years of his life, the father included this young son in many of the culminating projects of his own career while still a student at Harvard. Young Olmsted spent a summer working in Daniel Burner's office as the World Columbian Exposition arose in Chicago. After graduating from Yale in 1890, from Harvard, I beg your pardon, 1894, Rick spent a year on site at Biltmore. The 100,000 acre estate being developed for George Vanderbilt Jr. in Asheville, North Carolina. Here is the, uh, the Biltmore Gardens. And following his father's formal retirement in 1897, young Olmsted, at this point, now a professional young man, professional, prof a young professional at the beginning of his career, he became a full partner with his half brother, John Charles Olmsted, in the family business. Here it is, that very family business, Fairstead. It's now the Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Park, owned and operated by the National Park Service. You two can visit to explore the grounds, the house, the, the, the drafting rooms. There are exhibits, there are films, there are park rangers, and there are immense archives stored on the property of the original plants. It's really quite extraordinary. If you are interested in Olmsted, visit this site in Brookline, Massachusetts. Both sons, by the way, John Charles and Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. played key roles in founding the ASLA, the American Society for Landscape Architecture. Jr. helped establish and taught at the first professional landscape architecture program in the nation at Harvard, the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Junior emerged on the national scene in 1901 when he was appointed to the Commission of Fine Arts for the District of Columbia, known as the Macmillan Commission. This is the plan. Uh, he joined actually with the architects from Chicago. His father had passed away, but he joined with the architects from Chicago. Actually, his father was a 
hadn't quite passed away yet, but he would in two years. He was already in the hospital in the Boston area. So Junior joined with his father's colleagues from Chicago, charged with interpreting for the 20th century Pierre Charles L'Enfant's vision of the nation's capital. He, this was, the, the idea was to change, transform Washington, D.C. into a work of civic art and to devise a comprehensive plan for its future development. And a partial, but partial, listing of Junior's projects in the nation's capital reads like a guide to Washington, D.C., practically. And I'm only going to show you a few of the images, including the National Mall, the Jefferson Memorial, Roosevelt Island, the National Cathedral Grounds, the National Zoo, the White House grounds here indicated as the executive mansion. And one of everyone's favorite place to get away to from the hustle bustle of DC, Rock Creek Park. Now, by the way, sp speaking of the nation's capital, I want to remind you that Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. left his mark there. Sr. did extensive landscaping work on the US Capitol grounds, including reorienting the entrance and designing and seeing to the installation of the Capitol steps. I'm going to repeat that once, folks the Capitol steps. Remember, Olmsted Sr. saw all his public commissions as public spaces where Americans would enact democracy. In August 2015, the National Park Service hosted a special event commemorating the 150th anniversary of Olmsted's historic report, The Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Grove of Big Trees. That report is largely credited with providing the basis for the creation of Yosemite National Park. And its thoughtful wording is considered by many to be the first step in the establishment of our national park system, by the way. You might remember that the National Park Service celebrated its 100th anniversary in 2016. In fact, it was Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. who played a key role in writing the language for the Organic Act of 1916, the founding legislation for the U.S. National Park Service, like father, like son. Speaking of national parks, by the way, for 30 years, Rick Olmsted advised the National Park Service on issues of management and the conservation of scenic resources. He left his mark on national parks from coast to coast, including Maine's Acadia National Park, which I'll return to in a little bit, the Florida Everglades, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and Yosemite. Now, let's swing back to the East Coast, take a quick look at some of Junior's other works there quickly. Uh, but I'm going to start with the father because designing residential um, developments, enclaves, if you will. Oh, before I do, let me give you one gorgeous picture of Yosemite. I have to add in one gorgeous picture, right? Here it is. Isn't that stunning? There's Yosemite National Park in its full glory. Now back to those residential commissions. Starting with the father, uh, in Riverside, Illinois, one of the first planned green garden suburbs in the United States. Here is the Commons Park in the centerpiece of Riverside, but you can see the meandering path, the beautiful cl clusters of trees, the meadows. The same thing applied to all the streetscapes there with ample setbacks for the curvilinear streets and the beautiful homes. Gorgeous place, the entire community master planned by Frederick L. Olmsted Sr. His sons followed in his footsteps. With Junior, we're going to go north to south on the eastern seaboard. Junior designed master plan Forest Hills Gardens in Queens. He also master planned Roland Park in Baltimore. And a little further south in Florida, Mountain Lake uh, in Florida. Here is the uh, kind of, there is a, happens to be, it's a gated community. There happens to be a golf course. This is Colony House. I think I have another image for you of Mountain Lake. Let's see. Well, right next to Mountain Lake, by the way, I have to point this out because we're not touring Florida this morning, but I want to point out this one site. If you are ever in Orlando, Take an hour's drive south to the central highlands. Yes, there are highlands in this place in Florida. Go to one of the highest points in all of Florida, unless I'm mistaken, is the second highest point. Visit the jewel of a botanical garden known as Bach Tower Gardens there in Lake Wales, Florida. It is amazing. Matt designed by Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. That's the famous singing tower. Now, what about, uh, let's go west, shall we? Junior. The Olmsted brothers master planned the entire Denver mountain park system, an extensive system of parks uh, and parkways on the outskirts of Denver. Perhaps there's many famous such parks, but one that you might recognize, well, we lost the picture, but one that I want to feature is uh, Red Rock Park. You might have heard of the Red Rock Amphitheater, Red Rock Amphitheater. It's in Red Rock Park, one of the collection of the Denver mountain park system. 
Now, I think we're going to move into California. Here's Mountain View Cemetery. This is designed by Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. This is an historic image of Mountain View Cemetery. It was, if you will, the Greenwood Cemetery or the Mount Auburn Cemetery of the San Francisco Bay Area, where very famous uh, California notables are interred to this day. Olmsted transformed it into a beautiful, beautiful cemetery in the hills above Oakland. This is what it looks like today. You too can take bucolic walks through Mountain View Cemetery with views across the bay towards San Francisco today. In addition, Olmsted Sr had a client by the name of Leland Stanford, who had a huge ego. And it was a constant struggle between Leland Stanford and Olmsted with a great deal of compromising along the way. Uh, but um, the campus design for Stanford University is considered one of considerable, a ma campus master plan of considerable ambition and architectural brilliance to this day. And the Olmsted Stanford plan design is distinctive for its monumental scale and its use of sight lines that extend throughout the campus. There's the Hoover Tower. Here is an aerial of the entire Stanford campus. Later in the 20th century, by the way, going back to a little bit onto the other side of the bay, Junior was brought in, and the hills and valleys to the north, south, and east of the cities in Berkeley and Oakland, Beckland. The Olmsted brothers master planned an extensive system of semi-wild parks on the outskirts of these cities of the East Bay. Here is the original historic one, Tilden Regional Park. Here is one of the newer ones that was added, Franklin Ridge, that EBRPD stands for East Bay Regional Park District. And here it is a sprawling system of some 65 parks that started with an Olmsted Brothers master plan. Also in 1928, the California State Park Commission hired the Olmsted Brothers, to, Junior in fact, to conduct a survey identifying lands for the state park system, still considered one of the best in the nation. The final survey identified 125 potential parks in the process. Olmsted created a master plan for the entire system. And in his report, he proposed remaining, protecting the remaining 5% of California's magnificent redwoods, those that were not in the national park. There are the state redwoods, including those in the Santa Cruz Mountains. I hope these survived the fires of the last few years. And he said, you have to protect this desert, the largest state park in the state of California. Here it is in bloom, the Anza Borrego Desert. In 1913, a group of further south in California on the coast, a group of investors purchased 25,000 acres in the Palos Verdes Peninsula. They hired the Olmsted brothers to develop this coastal, expansive coastal landscape. It was one of the Olmsted brothers' largest and most complex projects. And in the end, they transformed rugged, hilly limeshale terrain to 16,000 acres suitable for a complete community, including residential areas, commercial center, uh, and extensive parkland open to the public. And this is what it looks like today. There is sweeping views and vistas to the Rocky Coast and the Pacific Ocean in Palos Verdes. Now, if we had more time today, I would spend a little more time heading back east and talk a little bit more detail. I'm going to go over, gloss over quickly to talk uh, about Biltmore because I want to get you to New England. But let me just say that George, it was George Vanderbilt Jr. who uh, had this vision to create his own private Central Park. He hired none other than Frederick Law Olmsted to help him create it. It was 100, started with 125,000 acres on the Biltmore Estate. Yes, the largest, most lavish private home ever built in America. I don't want to focus on the home. I want to focus on the landscape. This is what it, uh, here's the Biltmore Gardens under construction. Here are improvements to the grounds. They were in a degraded state. I have to tell you, when Vanderbilt first bought them, Olmsted made improvements, of course, as he would. And this is the view from Biltmore today, after all those decades, century of improvement. And Olmsted suggested that Biltmore ought to hire a young professional forester, Gifford Pinchot, to create the first scientifically, systematically managed forest in the United States, right there at Biltmore. Gifford Binchow would go on to become the first director of what we now call the U.S. Forest Service and a leading conservationist in the history of America and a great personal friend and ally of T.R., Teddy Roosevelt. He left the premises and they, he made improvements. I should say here is Biltmore Woods before and after. And he, they hired Carl Schenk, a German forester, to create the Biltmore Forestry School, the first forestry school ever to operate in the United States where the first class of foresters professionally trained came out of, here they are in horseback in the Pisgah. And this became the Pisgah National Forest, which the widow, Edith Vanderbilt, donated to the nation. There is the Cradle of Forestry today. You too can visit the Cradle of Forestry, an easy drive from the Biltmore Estate. Pretty cool. 
it's a it's a unique story there at Biltmore. It's not just the famous home and its gardens. It's the cradle of forestry in the United States, America, ladies and gentlemen. Now, there are other the Yale School of Forestry played a key role. Obviously, there's forestry in Maine as well. But this is kind of a unique story, what occurred at Biltmore. I wanted to share that with you. I think we want to go to New England, shall we? So I'm going to close with a quick tour of New England. Now, I'm going to start, by the way, uh, uh, if I covered all of New England, it would take another two hours. Can't do that. Even if I wanted to cover all of Massachusetts, it would take an hour. If I wanted to cover Newport, Rhode Island, that would be another half hour. Can't do but I want to talk about, uh, I'm going to take you in a narrow band from the southeast, from the south shore of Boston, really, to Orono, Maine. And I'm going to start at, I could mention, if I had time, Olmsted Legacy Parks in New Bedford and Fall River. But we're going to start here in the small town of North Easton. And it was one of the key places where architect H.H. H. Richardson and Fred FLO, by the way, is Frederick Law Olmsted. And this is where they collaborated. There you have the Oak Ames Memorial Hall and the Ames Free Library. Structures by Richardson, landscapes by Olmsted in the lovely little town of Northeastern. Going a little further north, one of my favorite places in all of New England, the World's End Reservation in Hingham, right on the coast. Oh, is it something special, folks, on a promontory of land, as you can see, jutting into Hingham Bay. Part of it is a rocky coastal land, partly forested, protected wetlands. This is the isthmus. Uh, uh, by a carriageway, it leads to this bucolic landscape. It's practically right out of, uh, uh, of the English country, as an English country park. It's extraordinary. Uh, and by the way, I, I've been known to go there year round, including cross country skiing in the winter. A little known fact, this very site was considered to be a serious seriously under consideration to be the location to build the headquarters of the United Nations. True. It's a, it's a true, true fact. You can look it up. Now, you've already learned about the Emerald, going to Boston, you've already learned about the Emerald Necklace, string of parks in Boston. But further afield, there's another entire outer necklace of parks around metropolitan Boston. The park system was the brainchild of Charles Elliott, who started his career with the firm of Olmsted, Olmsted and Elliott. Formerly the park lands of the MDC when I was growing up, the Metropolitan District Commission. They're now managed by the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, the DCR. It's a necklace on the outskirts of Boston. Really, arguably, you can point to this too as an Olmsted legacy. I'm going to point to just two of the more well-known such parks, the Blue Hills Reservation. I love the bottom picture here. It's, it's called A Yoga Hike in the Blue Hills. That's the title of the picture. There they are. A uh, nice aut aut autumnal picture of the Blue Hills Reservation. This is Boston Milton. Going a little further north, you have the Middlesex Fells Reservation in Stoneham, also part of the MDC, the DCR system of parks in metropolitan Boston. Traveling a little further north, uh, you have in Beverly is a jewel of a property that in the coming years will reopen to the public as a newly restored and intact property, Moraine Farm. Some scholars consider this to be a masterwork of a small estate landscape designed by Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. Just a little ways north brings us to one of everyone's favorite places, not far, not only for the actual Olmsted landscape, which I'm going to reveal in a second, but also for the famous North Shore Beach next door, Crane Beach. This is Castle Hill on the Crane Estate in Ipswich. It's, here's an aerial. Here is a picture of the Rose Garden not pre-blooming unless I'm mistaken. There's the Rose Garden on the left. You can see it's gorgeous sculptural design and the Italian garden on the right, all by the way, designed by the Olmsted brothers. By the way, I should mention before I go any further that uh, there is a statewide organization, the Trustees for Reservations, a private nonprofit land trust. It's also an Olmsted legacy, you could say, as the trustees were also a brainchild of Charles Eliot. And three of the sites that I featured here, World's End, Moraine Farm, and Castle Hill, are all reservation properties, which is pretty cool. They have an extensive list of properties across Massachusetts. A, cart, a large number are Olmsted landscapes. Let's go a little further north. We're going to end our little tour of Massachusetts, then end up in Maine. How about in Andover? The Phillips Andover Academy is one of several famous private or prep schools that manifest in Olmsted landscape. Deck five decades of Olmsted family involvement, starting with Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. in 1891. Then the Olmsted brothers firm continued with John C. Olmsted and Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. Later in the 20th century, a, a famous member of the firm, Percival Gallagher, oversaw this, all resulting in many additional design elements and improvement to the distinctive academic landscape of the Phillips Adenover Academy. Heading north, we're entering Maine. First stop, Portland. 
both the Eastern Promenade, here it is, and the Western Promenade. I, this is cool. I, uh, you have a vintage card up above, and I found this gorgeous, maybe it's Photoshopped, I don't know, but it's a gorgeous uh, sunset picture taken from the Western Promenade. Uh, but these were both designed, master planned, designed by the Olmsted brothers, by the way, in Portland. Uh, in 1905. I, I should share that with you. But how about let's go further north to the state capital, Augusta. Here is the governor's mansion. I think everyone in Maine probably knows this as Blaine House, landscape designed by Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. He also, uh, 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 he, the grounds also, by the way, the Olmsted brothers were involved extensively at the state capital. The entire grounds and Capitol Park next door are all an Olmsted Brothers landscape design in Augusta. So a significant imprint, footprint, if you will, of the Olmsted Brothers in Augusta. Going further north, you all know this, just a little north of Rockland is Camden, a famous picturesque tourist friendly town, famous for its beautiful harbor. Well, in fact, it was uh, actually uh, patron Mary Lewis Curtis Bach brought Frederick Holmes de Jr. into prepare a plan in 1928 for the neglected two acre hillside between Camden Harbor and the Camden Library. Simultaneously, by the way, Fletcher Steele designed the Camden Library Amphitheater, which I dare say some of you know, directly next door to this where you're looking. And this was a unique convergence of works by two of the most important American landscape architects in the 20th century, right there, Fletcher Steele and Frederick Holmes de Jr. I have to tell you, I've had a hard time finding a good quality image of the Village Green, which is the piece that Olmsted Jr. in particular was responsible for. But this is, we're looking, we're in Harbor Park at this point, looking obviously towards the harbor. So both Jr. and Fletcher Steele were involved with this project. Let's go further north to the only national park in Maine on Mount Desert Island. And that would be beautiful Acadia National Park. I'll reveal a picture in a minute, but the Olmsted Brothers history is worth exploring. The 27 mile park loop road is the main route for driving to Acadia National Park's hiking trails and natural attractions, including, of course, Cadillac Mountain. Now, automobiles were banned between 1908 and 1915 due to a disagreement, by the way, between Mount Desert Island's year round residents and summer visitors about whether to allow automobiles inside the park. And seeing uh, the inevitability of the automobile, summer resident John D. Rockefeller, Jr., partially financed the construction of this loop road to keep cars out of the park's interior and off his carriage roads. He hired Frederick Olmsted Jr. of the Olmsted Brothers in 1929 to recommend routes, uh, locate scenic overlooks, remove native, native, vegetation, native vegetation, and open up views and prepare engineering details for this roadway that would be built. There is an engineering detail on the left, Otter Cliff Road. This is that very roadway as it's heading toward our Otter Cliff present day. The Park Loop Road was listed as part of the Acadia National Park multiple property listing in the National Register of Historic Places in 2005. So the Olmsted brothers principally were involved with the Park Loop Road and all the landscaping attendant to that roadway complex, which is extensive, by the way. Now, we also cannot neglect the principal campus of the University of Maine in Orono, can we? One of the nation's first land-grant colleges. Maine's College of Agriculture and Mechanic Arts was initially designed by Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. in 1867. I'll get there yet. Olmsted's overall plan was rejected by the trustees, but they adopted his concepts. Uh, and eventually the Olmsted brothers were selected later on in the 20th century, 1932, to address future campus growth, led by Olmsted Brothers firm member Carl Rust Parker, another famous member of the firm. The firm's plan called for uh, new buildings along a north-south axis independent of the river, a rectangular mall with an elm alley flanked by symmetrical buildings and a naturalistic lake with landscape paths. In 1948, the firm created a revised plan without that lake. Today's 600 acre campus, portion of which you see here, reflects elements of both the earlier and later Olmsted plans. The original Riverside Parade Ground and Arboretum remain open for recreation and river access. The Olmsted Brothers Mall and its buildings are the most significant remaining parts of their two plans. Here's the mall, of course. Obviously, as you all know, renamed, renamed the University of Maine at Orono in 1897. This campus was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1978. Let's end our tour of Maine by heading out to Deer Isle. After a prolific career designing green space across America, Frederick Olmsted's health, the senior, the father was deteriorating and his wife Mary decided to remove him from his bustling home office in Brookline, move him to Deer Isle, Maine. 
in a bid to improve his failing health. In fact, Olmsted Sr. had made a trip to England before this to combat his health, but he became back depressed with the dreary English climate. And it was Mary who asked her son, Frederick Olmsted Jr., to build the family a summer retirement home. In 1897, Olmsted Jr. contracted Boston architect William Ralph Emerson, known for his shingle style home designs in Maine, to build Felstead. This is Felstead, as distinct from Fairstead in Brookline. Emerson's landscape plan was intended to stimulate uh, Olmsted Sr.'s decreasing mental abilities. The Olmsteads spent one single summer here at Felstead, and at the end of which they were unhappy, and Olmsted Sr.'s health continued to deteriorate. After Felstead, the family decided to commit Olmsted Sr. to McLean Hospital, where he would spend the rest of his life passing away in 1903. As I understand it, by the way, and I'm not absolutely sure about the details, but Felstead remained in the Olmsted family hands for a couple or three decades hence into the 20th century, but then it was sold and resold many times. In fact, I believe it was just resold or on the docket to be sold just a few years ago. It is still privately owned. Now I'm going to bring this program to a close. You're wondering when I'm going to get there. So during this past couple of years of COVID quarantine and social distancing, I just want to leave this up. Public parks have been a lifesaver for so many of us, seeking fresh air, exercise, physical and psychological health, and doing so safely. Frederick Olmsted now appears so entirely prescient, as for one, he emphasized public health, mental health, and taking it even further, spiritual health benefits of the park experience for everyone in a democracy. Though Olmsted did not use terms so in common in our vocabulary today, terms such as equity and access. However, if one reads his writings, you could argue that he cared deeply about all those issues. So as we commemorate Olmsted Sr.'s birthday and the Olmsted landscape -like design legacy during 2022, we also highlight the ever more crucial role that the public park experience plays in our lives. Needless to say, COVID and social and environmental justice movements have only greatly underlined that very fact and the urgent need to provide more green space to distribute it equitably and to make all such spaces accessible and inviting to all. In fact, it isn't too much of a stretch to say, ladies and gentlemen, that that was Frederick Law Olmsted's agenda from the very start. I want to leave you with these thoughts. In fact, I'm going to leave you, I'm going to let, let Daniel Burnham, the driving force for the World Columbian Exposition close out this program. When the World's Fair was about to set to open in 1893 at a dinner with all the artists and architects from around the land gathered to laud Burnham for his achievements, and he was a big ego gentleman. Burnham himself pivoted to the side, and he said this about his collaborator, Olmsted. This, by the way, is the famous, famous John Singer Sargent portrait of Frederick Law Olmsted, which is on view. You will always see it when you tour Biltmore. This is what Burnham had to say about his partner, Olmsted, quote, each of you knows the name and genius of him who stands first in the heart and confidence of American artists, the creator of your own parks, Frederick Law Olmsted, an artist. He paints with lakes and wooded slopes, with lawns and banks and forest covered hills, with mountainsides and ocean views. He should stand where I do tonight, not for the deeds of later years alone, but what his brain hath wrought and his pen hath taught for half a century, unquote. Finally, finally, folks, in Olmsted's own words, the beauty of the park should be the beauty of the fields, the meadow, the prairie, of the green pastures and the still waters. What we want to gain is tranquility and rest to the mind. Is it doubtful that it does men good to come together this way in pure air and under the light of heaven? Frederick Law Olmsted seems to me that that prescription, if you will, rings as loud today in 2022 as it did in the late 19th century. Thank you, Frederick Law Olmsted and Sons. Thanks to all of you for your time and attention today. Thanks for the, to the Farnsworth Museum for hosting me for this program that I'm able to deliver to all of you across the land today. It's been a pleasure. Now, I'm going to be making Electronically, I have a, an extensive list of resources, books, recommendations that I'm going to be making available to the Farnsworth Museum. They will have it available in digital form to send to any of you who've registered. I have yet to send it, but I will. 
Uh, I'm going to power through a bunch of these. Here are some of those recommended books, including very, this is my favorite newest book. I will highlight this one, just published. It's an extraordinary book. It's so revealing. Olmsted and Yosemite, Civil War, Abolition, and the National Park Idea. The two co-authors, one of whom is uh, Vermont-based, have been busy traveling around the nation and doing virtual programs in the last few weeks. Uh, forthcoming, another key book by a friend, historian Sarah Cedar Miller, published in one month's time before Central Park is, another, is going to be another key, key volume to the literature. Uh, if you want to learn about Olmsted 200, take a snap a screenshot of this, olmsted200.org. There's social media. Just go to olmsted200.org. You can find out about everything going on all across America today, tomorrow, April 26th, the entire calendar year of 2022. Literally everywhere across America, there's something going on. Uh, this is, you take another screenshot of this if you like, because this takes you to our dedicated URL for our PBS film, which is different from what you would find by randomly searching for it on PBS. There's much more video material and essays that are on this dedicated website, which is hard to find if you're just randomly searching for it. So feel free to take a screenshot of that rather complex URL. And uh, this is just a few of my resources that I've utilized. And this is how you can reach me, folks. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Right. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Gosh, there was just such a, a wonderful, deep, deep dive into Oldstead and what a multifaceted uh, person he was and creator. And it's inspired a lot of questions, I think. So I think uh, we'll just get right into it. I've got a couple of questions on the screen. The first question is to what event, or to, excuse me, to what extent rather did Olmsted's urban parks generate urban development, perhaps akin to the high lines surrounding high end developments today? Well, yes, uh, it's very clear. It's a good question, by the way. And it's very clear that that's very much what happened with Central Park, staying, staying in New York. That's totally what happened with Central Park, particularly the uh, west side. Uh, but that's unquestionably, uh, it, it caused, for lack of a better word, gentrification. And, and, and that eventually that whole, remember when they built Central Park, that whole section of New York was undeveloped, largely, largely undeveloped. Um, yes, there were some little farms and there were some little communities and there was some housing and there's some controversy around some of what existed in the landscape of Central Park before Central Park was built, I'll have you know. Uh, but uh, it, 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 New York, Manhattan, that section of Manhattan subsequently boomed once Central Park was fully built out. And, and no question, uh, and by the way, uh, Buffalo, New York also, and, and this was by design. Olmsted saw himself as an urban planner in Buffalo. And he knew that the, and the city fathers of Buffalo, in fact, wanted their city to grow. They wanted him to help help the city grow. And so he designed his extensive system of parks and parkways and traffic circles so that the city would grow and fill in the dots. Um, and Buffalo is, became quite successful in that respect. So there's no question that this occurred. Now, it did have gentrification has its positives and negatives, doesn't it? So, uh, and you can talk about that in the 20th century, not just with Olmsted parks, but other park systems in America, even those that weren't Olmsted parks that had their uh, somewhat uh, of a negative impact where uh, property prices obviously were impacted and, and uh, renters uh, sometimes are pushed out of their communities where they've been living for a long time. Um, so gentrification is a, always a mixed, um, has a mixed benefit, if you will. But that's a good question. Yeah. I can't hear you. Beg your pardon there. Uh, okay. okay, so let's do other questions coming in. Can you tell us about any Olmsted work as it relates to Rockport Weather End and Beach Hill? I cannot. And if there's something there that I'm not aware of, I, I profess utter ignorance in that respect. I don't know of Olmsted in that particular area of Rock, Rockport. And uh, obviously, I do know something about the Olmsted legacy in Maine, but if there's something there, I'm just not aware of it. I apologize. Something for further research for all Indeed. of us as we as we delve into Olmsted absolutely here. and and believe me after every one of these programs after such questions arise inevitably I I I follow up with some research <laughs> so 
So somebody has asked, uh, uh, do you think Olmsted influenced park development in Europe? Good question. I, I would put it to you that he influenced park development worldwide. Um, uh, the Olmsteads were so influential. Mind you, the Par Parisian, many of you have been to Italy, many of you have been to Paris. The, 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 the continental park tradition is very different from the English country park tradition. Very different, the older parks I'm talking about, not the newer parks but the older park designs, which started as private parks, of course, in Italy and France, they weren't public parks, except for uh, in one instance in Paris, of course, there's the large public park there, but a uh, very different aesthetic sense of these designs. But in, later in the 20th century, there's no question about it, the Olmsted tradition, uh, legacy, design influence, philosophy, aesthetics, uh, went worldwide. And there's no question that landscape architecture would follow whether they wanted to admit it or not. <laughs> were at least subliminally influenced by the Olmsted aesthetic. Some of them intentionally moved away from that aesthetic later in the 20th century, I'll have to tell you. Uh, but uh, there's no question that early on in the, 20th, the City Beautiful movement and the Olmsted Park uh, uh, aesthetic had an, a, a worldwide influence in Europe and in Latin America and even in Asia, by the way. Great, great. Well, so much for us to consider. Um, Lawrence, we want to really thank you so much for your, your expertise, your time in, in bringing us across the country to really think about uh, Frederick Law Olmsted in his, his birthday year. Uh, and we certainly thank you again, all of our Farnsworth watchers, our members and our soon to be members. We are so happy to have you in the galleries and online. And if you do come up to Maine this summer, uh, please uh, come see us, say hello. We'll have the Ashley Bryan show up in just a few weeks. Ashley Bryan is our Made in America award winner for 2022. We also have a Leonard Baskin exhibition, which is opening up quite soon, actually in just a couple of weeks. And then we have, as mentioned, our Farnsworth Ford exhibition, which is an exhibition uh, reinterpretation and a rethinking of our permanent collection with some new acquisitions as well. Uh, so we certainly look forward to seeing you next time in the galleries and in line in just another few weeks. We have another Earth Day lecture, if you will, and that is on April 28th, our Farnsworth Forum series uh, with climate curator Dr. Soren Brothers from the Royal Ontario Museum of Art. And we are going to be looking at art through the lens of the environment. Lawrence, thank you again so much. And, uh, and please let us know again when you're in the area or we'll, we'll come find you somewhere in, in Massachusetts when you haunt down there. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gwendolyn. And thanks to everyone at the Farnsworth Museum for making arrangements and for hosting this program today. And thank you very much for such an attentive audience out there. And, and enjoy, you know, we're coming out of COVID, everyone. Uh, uh, take a road trip. Uh, visit your regional parks and seek out the Olmsted legacy uh, in your neighborhood or when you travel to other parts of the country. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure today. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you again soon.